So now everything is we say from this point on, it's being recorded. And then I go over to here, and that brings up the screen that you would be seeing out there. Right? You see it, Mark? I'm almost there. Okay. When I looked at the uh, enrollment for this course, a lot of the people who are in the great beyond are former students. So they know how all this works. So they're, you know, they know that by tomorrow morning, they will receive an email that says, here is the video from last night's class. Um, I post those in the class itself, as well as sending it to you as an, uh, as an announcement so that, you know, so what does that mean? That means that if you have life that comes up that you can't be here, all you got to do is just text me. And I'll tell you that in just a second here. That's all I care about. I just want to make sure you're okay. But if you need to be absent from class, you now know that it always will be sitting here waiting for you. Okay? You never have to literally miss miss. And my text number is, in fact, that's why I have my phone. I don't, normally don't bring my phone into class. But tonight I did because people might be trying to talk to us. It's 502-457-2937. I think that's in the syllabus as well. So it's 502-457-2937. And whenever I send you all out an announcement, which you will get every Monday of the week before class, uh, that will have just a quickie little video of me saying this is what we're doing or we're continuing to do depends upon, you know, what we're, where we're at. Um, and I'm in that video, you always hear me give that text number. I don't have a problem with it. First time you ever text me, if you just say, hi, it's Steve from 585 or Mark from 585, that way I can put you into my contact so I know who you are. Now I went and got my new phone um, and they took all the contacts and swapped them over. They were like, do you realize you have 5,000 contacts in your phone? Well, yeah. You all ready? You there, Mark? I'm in. All right. So here we go. Gentlemen, what we're going to do tonight and the folks in the great beyond is I want to go over um, the layout of the course. We're going to look at all the modules of the course. We're going to look at the syllabus. And I think it would behoove us, behoove me, that I show you the live text as well so that we kind of cover the basis so you know how things are going to work and how what are the expectations for the class. The expectations for the class are that this is a community of learners and you are to ask questions. You are to make sure that if I don't cover something completely to your satisfaction, you let me know. Uh, we have what I would call um, proficient technologists out there in the great beyond taking this course who are already using a lot of tools. And I challenged one of them the other day when she called me and was talking to me that she has other stuff that she needs to share with us. Um, I have the latest greatest, but what I need from everybody who is in this community is if you have been using something in your class that you think makes sense that you like, uh, you need to let me know, and then we can incorporate it in. And you'll see that as we go through these modules. I build everything on a module system. Uh, each module represents like a project-based learning example. Uh, I find that that is the best way to compartmentalize what we have to do so that people understand that this is what we're doing for this module, this is what we're doing for this module. The first two modules I will do together with you in terms of now that we're finished, let's go put it over here in the live text just to show you how to do that. In terms of when are things due in the live text, when is the class finished? That's when things are due. Um, I do it that way because there are some people who will go into it and immediately get it done and they throw it into live text. I find that it really doesn't have the depth of either understanding or the depth of quality that I would like to see. And so I basically leave it open. Every once in a while, I drop back in and I'll remind people at this point in the course, uh, as we get close to midterm, uh, we need to be putting stuff in. That's why I do the two together, because I need to show you how it works, how easy it is to do. 
Um, live text, as we all know, has some, um, how should we say, peculiarities about it that we need to be aware of and that we need to get people off the ledge when they go to put things in the live text and they go, it doesn't work. Yes, I'm fully aware of that it doesn't work and I know how to make it work, so it's not a big deal. So if you guys are ready, well, I guess maybe I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Steve Swan. I'm here at the University of Louisville. This is my 11th year working here as a full-time instructor. I've been here 20 years, part-time before that. Before that, I was the instructional technology specialist in Jefferson County Public Schools. Uh, after 31 years of being a teacher, resource teacher, specialist, I retired out and came here. They called me up and they said, why don't you come and get your dissertation done? And we'd like to talk to you about helping out the person who does instructional technology. I had met her. I liked her a lot. So I said, sure. In fact, I had been teaching part time with her. So, you know, to me, it was like, OK, this is what I can do when I retire. When I got over here. And it was the third night of my first class I ever taught here that Karen Karp, who was the chair at that time uh, of TNL, she was standing in the doorway right there. And I thought I'd done something wrong. And she said, I need to talk to you immediately after class. Well, you'd have to have known Dr. Karp. She was a no nonsense, take no prisoners kind of person, actually a lovely person though, once you got to know her. So I, you know, I go to see her afterwards thinking, well, okay, I can find something else to do. And she sat me down and she said, the person who normally was the faculty person in charge of all of this had just gone, literally left. Um, and I said, well, okay, do we help you when you go to interview somebody? She says, yes, that's what we want. We want you to help us interview. So they brought, you know, people in for interviews and phone, et cetera. And then she showed up my door another night <laughs> and she said, we want you to interview. Okay, so I interviewed for the job and I got the job. Um, meanwhile, everything else is still on the burner, right? Get it done, get it done, get it done. But then when I took the job, what I didn't realize was that they wanted me to build an entire program. Okay, that's fine. I did curriculum in Jefferson County, so I can do curriculum here. And I started building it and walking into walls and I built some more and walked into a few more walls and so on and so on. About three years ago, the state started rumbling and making noises about pathways and high schools needing to have. Um, they were more interested in people having specific endorsements. This is when we had the teacher leadership model uh, than they did people having just a blank check master's degree. Uh, so we created I created a 12 hour endorsement. My chair convinced me to make it 12 hours instead of the original 15 that I was going to do because what? Why Mark? Why Steve? Steve, Steve would know you wouldn't Mark. Money? Yeah, it's called money. You need 15 past something. 15 past your rank one, 15 past your rank two, so on and so on. So anyway, she thought it'd be easier to market it if it were 12. No harm, no foul. If people want to do the whole endorsement, when we get done with the 12, but they still need the 15, we just do an independent study and they take some aspect of it and they put it together. Like I've got a gal right now over at uh, Olmstead North who is teaching seventh grade math and every kid has an iPad. So we're doing a little qualitative study about does it make a difference? Every kid having an iPad because the district ain't doing it. Um, we did in one to one many, many years ago with Shawnee, uh, Western Middle and Moore High and Middle. And you better believe we we ran all kinds of data over that whole disaster. And it was a disaster. And I was really worried when I heard there because I was in charge of it back then. But I was really worried when I heard they were going to try it again, because so many things that went wrong, it seemed like they were just going to reproduce what went wrong. So we'll see. Um, so we have an endorsement that is 12 hours long that uh, if you want the full 15, it's an easy just to put an independent study in and put together something that you would like to do. So that's who I am. Uh, I do not go by Professor Swan or Dr. Swan, any of that stuff. I just go by Steve because I always did when I was a teacher. 
and when I was a district person administrator, I'd walk into these offices and I'd have to sit there and listen to the doctor so and so who is the principal pontificate and I just kind of smile and I'd go, you know, I got one of those too. Can we just talk about what we're doing here? Okay, let's now do this. Um, the syllabus is there. Um, it's easy enough to pull up the syllabus and the blackboard and the um, live text should all be in sync. If there's anything in the syllabus that doesn't jive with the blackboard, please let me know. I've gone over it three times, but I still could have missed something. When in doubt, we will refer to the Blackboard, okay? Because it is really where uh, my teaching starts. Uh, I am a comfortable Blackboard user. Um, probably I would call myself a proficient Blackboard user. I do things inside a Blackboard that the people here at, at uh, UofL kind of go, uh, we're not so sure you should be doing that, but too bad. It works, and uh, I have a background in this stuff in JCPS. We had the O-Angel system, um, and Jana Hickey and I worked together on the distance learning programs back in JCPS. Jana was the uh, distance learning specialist. I was the instructional technology specialist. We were best friends. We did cool stuff. So this is an environment that I'm very comfortable in, but I do it a very different way than you may have been used to. Uh, I try to put lots and lots of resources into the Blackboard for you uh, so that it becomes easy for you to understand where we are and what we're doing. As I said, every module in here is a project-based learning exercise. Uh, there'll be times when I have to talk at you, but mostly what I try to do is, as Dr. Fullen, who is our author for this uh, class, uh, talks about in his book, Stratosphere, he talks about learning by on the skinny, understanding the skinny. What he is referring to is, and this is something I've always firmly believed in, if it takes me 15 minutes or more to show kids a piece of technology and how to use it, then it ain't worth doing. It's just not worth messing with. Because after 15 minutes, unless it's a specific kind of technology class, you know, like if I'm teaching a graphics uh, arts class in high school, yeah, it's I'm going to be spending lots of time showing them about Photoshop. But if what I'm really teaching is social studies, science, math, language arts, then the tool should be a tool that's very easily grasped. And again, this is something we'll hear from fully. Your book that we will be using is called Stratosphere. Let me jump in here to the first module and show you. This is what it looks like. This is Stratus here. Uh, it is written by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Fullen. I actually know Dr. Fullen. Um, he is the former dean of the College of Education at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is also widely, widely known and, re and revered as the creator of something called change theory uh, as it relates to education. He's on the wall out here. When you come up the stairs, all those pictures out there on the wall are Gronmeyer Award winners. He's one of them. Um, he's a very, very likable guy. He is, uh, but he also, he, he's, he's a classic boy. He is a classic administrator. He used to call the group of people that I worked with at the University of Toronto, he used to call us a cult uh, because part of the problem was we were so way ahead of where the technology was at that time and the things that we were doing with kids in schools. But then once Dr. Fullen understood what we were doing, he became a huge cheerleader for us. I like his writing. It's very readable. It is not too academia based, you know, although he is a God, he is a name dropper. Is he ever a name dropper? But we will introduce you to some of these names and these people that he talks about in his book. We are going to basically do a book study of his book, but we're really going to be focused on, I get to do chapter one with you next week. Um, we're going to be looking at chapters two and three and four and five. Okay. Now, if anybody wants to have a fit about, you're telling me I have to go out and buy this book, which is all $15, by the way. 
you have to go out and buy this book because you want me to use it in this class. That's ridiculous. Okay, fine. There you go. There it is. There's chapters two and three, four and five. Uh, I have Dr. Fullen's permission to do to use it this way. And uh, like I said, uh, there is a love hub right across the street from where the College of Education is in Toronto. The College of Education in Toronto sits on a street called Bloor. Uh, Bloor was famous or infamous in the time of the hippies. It was the hate Ashbury of Toronto. And it still has that kind of vibe about it. It's an interesting place. But uh, there's a pub right across the street there that well, we used to go to uh, with Dr. Fullen. And, uh, and he's, a, he's a very likable guy. In fact, there is a video in here I'll show you when we get to him. Uh, that cracks me up because it's in the alleyway between where the College of Ed is and where this pub was. So it's kind of like he was probably headed that way and they caught him in the alley. His writing is very clear. I think it's very understandable. And I think it's more importantly, it is so, so current. He is also the author of something that I see that JCPS is also using called Deep Learning which again, I find very funny. Um, and you will kind of get a, you'll hear an echo of deep learning in some of the stuff that he talks about in this book. This is the first book that he did deep learning, um, especially his five C's. We'll go over all that. So here's the book that we'll be using. As I said, uh, I've got it right here in case you need it. Uh, I'll be doing this PowerPoint for chapter one. We will be here are the, the chapters again. I put them everywhere. And then we'll be using a tool called Pictochart, which we will create our own um, infographic that will basically show your understanding of chapters two, three, and four, and five. That will be the first thing we do. Here are some of the people that he talks about in the in the first uh, well chapters two and three. This is Marshall McLuhan. Uh, the thing that's so amazing about Marshall McLuhan, can you see that date? 1967. You won't believe what he was talking about back then. This is a very important guy. Um, he represents sort of the the negative side of technology and education, and we need to hear it. You'll read about it. But the way Mike talks about it, I think he, he doesn't give it enough depth, enough justice. So we need to hear his voice. Uh, let's see. Who else we got down here? There's Mike. There's Dr. Fuller. And that's the alley. <laughs> you go right down here. You go right down there. And you hang around. And there's <laughs> right across the street's the pub. So... Uh, that's that's him. And then we have another guy. This guy's name is Mark Prinsky. Prinsky was hot, hot, hot for a while. Uh, he was the he is the originator, the owner of the phrase digital native. Uh, before then, there was a guy by the name of Tap Scott who had something called um, Generation Generation X, I think it was. And then, of course, millennials came along. But this guy is the one who coined the phrase digital native and digital immigrant. Uh, I'm not quite sold on Prinsky's work, but he's worth mentioning because he, again, you'll hear him in Mike's stuff, Dr. Fullen. I got to quit calling him Mike. He's Dr. Fullen. Uh, as you can see in this first module, I put out the information uh, that is. I think relevant to what he's trying to get us to understand. Uh, you will hear and hear me reference back to him constantly. Um, as you can see here, Fullen is convinced that we can and must build irresistibly engaging learning experiences for both students and teachers. I love his notion of the skinny solutions that are hard to build and easy to implement. He, want, he puts the onus on educational leaders to make change easier by adding enjoyable, worthwhile experiences. This is the pain of becoming a technologist. 
the technology, that's what I refer to you people as. You are technologists. And if you look at the areas of the mission that this university or this college has given us, the, the part of that mission, you are the acolytes. You are the people who are going out to spread the word that Google Classroom doesn't have to be this dead end place that we just basically post stuff for kids. It can be an interactive, exciting experience that kids can actually learn from. Um, and that's what this guy is trying to get us to understand. I'm going to walk through and then I'll come back, okay, because I want to show you other things. We then are going to do in module two, and this is a module where I guess of all the modules, this is the lift. I call the lift the hardest part of the course. This is the lift because I'm going to be throwing three, count them, three different theoretical foundations at you. The first one is called TPAC. TPAC stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. Again, this is based upon work uh, by another Grammeyer Award winner uh, on his work with what he calls the pedagogical content uh, knowledge that teachers need to have to be excellent teachers. Two guys came along from Michigan State University, um, Kohler and Punya Mishra who basically added the T component. And this has been a part of every, whenever you read anything that has to do with instructional technology that is talking at a research base, this is one of the first things that gets thrown in. It's really straightforward, but it is not a, it is not a practitioner's use, okay? Uh, it's very much a researcher's use. The TIM that you see up there, the TIM stands for Technology Integration Matrix, this is practitioner based, but it is a from a long line of us trying to figure out how in the hell can we understand what teachers are doing with technology in their classrooms. That was my old job. We used many, many different survey tools to try to figure that out. So we'll take a look at what's the latest. This is this is the one that is the latest, greatest that is in use in Jefferson County. I don't know how they're using it, but it is in use. And then the last one there, the last acronym, UDL, this is near and dear to my heart. This is Universal Design for Learning. I have a very strong problem with what uh, teachers are being told, how to handle all this diverse uh, groupings that we have in classrooms. Uh, right now, or at least it was, the, the whole Tomlinson uh, thing about differentiated instruction, I, I found Tomlinson's work to be very flawed in that it really doesn't understand the, the practitioner's reality. Universal Design for Learning has a great deal of research sitting behind it, which kind of puts people off at first. But then when we unpack it and I show you that what it's really about is how do we find a way for everyone to experience the curriculum? The curriculum is what's broken, not the kids. And so the elevator speech of UDL is um, pathways in for everyone. Uh, finding the way that the, the kid who struggles the most in the class can have success in the class to the benefit of everyone in the class. In other words, there's no losers. So that's UDL. So that's the lift. Um, then from that, we'll go through, and here is, I saved this for the middle of the course because I want to, the old, the old way we had it set up, we did Google Classroom right out of the box. In fact, you still see a little pieces of it back up there in module one. I will turn those off because what I really want to do is I want to save it for here because I want to do it right. I want to give it the justice that it uh, needs, but I also want to be able to focus on its limitations, and there are limitations, okay? And so we have to come up with a way to make our Google Classrooms really become the kind of places that um, we read about from Dr. Uh, Dr. Fullen's books. And so doing that, we're going to be looking at putting it together, uh, the nuts and bolts of actually putting it together. And as you can see, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Now, Steve, you have a Google Classroom? Okay. Um, 
we're going to have to have a conversation and everyone else out there who is a Google Classroom teacher. Now, Mark over here, he can make his own. And by the way, Mark, the university is finally getting around to acknowledging it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, we are going to have to have a conversation about how you all are going to share back to me what you have. Because right now, uh, I can't get into your classrooms just by you sh putting me into your classroom. I'm not a part of the JCPS Google Classroom domain. I'm working on it. Um, if we can get to that, then it'd be a cinchy thing. You'd give me your code for your class code. I would come in, put the code in. Boom, I could see what you're doing in there. Um, I don't think we're going to have to do anything too crazy. Maybe just a screenshot or two showing what you've done and then put that in. We'll talk. And I'm not just talking to Steve. I'm talking to anybody out there. Um, last semester, one of my students who is in this class tonight, I was able to see her stuff, but uh, when I went back and tried to look at it, I'm not seeing it anymore. So whoever was up in her county that was allowing me to see it basically said, nope, and they turned it off. Or it could be here. Um, U of L at present uh, is supposed to be whitelisting the Google Classroom, meaning that if I try to get to it from a University of Louisville computer, I could see it of uh, the student I had in last semester who let me see hers, I would have to go in and look at it from home because that way I wasn't fighting with the university's firewall. So we'll see. But what we really want to do is we want to look at all these amazing applications. Look at this, folks. I have 50 of these that allow you to put in hooks back into your Google Classroom. And we'll be playing with a lot of these in class. We'll be seeing how we could use these in class. Some of these are, I, you know, some of these I can look at and go, eh, I'm not a fan of Khan Academy. Um, but the others that are in here, you know, I just think are some of the best things that we got out there. Buncee, Pear Deck, you know, the list goes on and on. So we are going to really take our time and understand Google Classroom. Uh, we're also going to take our time and understand another part of the Googleverse called Google Sites. Uh, a Google Site is nothing more than a web presence, but what makes it so powerful is it has its hooks back into the classroom. So moving out of classroom, moving into sites and back is very easy to set up. Why would we do that? Well, one of the things that Google Classroom has as a negative is it does not understand embeddable code. An embeddable code is how the world works in terms of interactivity on the web. Uh, Google Classroom, I don't really understand why I've talked to, I'm a Google trainer, by the way, um, certified Google trainer. When I talk to the folks at Google, uh, and I have friends out there at Mountain View, you know, they're like, we want to have to worry about nefarious code getting into our classrooms. That's a really good, fair answer. Here's the problem. If you have a Google Sites, guess what it does? Supports embeddable code. <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, you won't let me do it in Classroom, but you'll let me do it over here in Sites. Well, yeah, there's not a problem. Yeah, but your Sites has hooks back in the Classroom. Oh, so there we are. So we're going to look at this. As I said, you have to understand, folks, this is a class that there are certain things that are from Steve, full and being one of those. There are certain things that we learn together, this being a perfect example of that. We're learning together how to the best fit, how we see the best fit for classroom in our work that we do. That takes us to module four. Module four is kind of a fun one. Uh, this is all about the digital native. This is the nod to Prinsky. Uh, I have a lot of things in here for us to read about the digital native. Is it real? You know, do we really, is there something called a digital native? Sorry about that. Is there something called the digital native? What does it mean? Is it really real? Here they are. Um, and then what we're going to do with that for just giggles, because I think it's probably one of the best things that we play with in this course, is a tool called Beyond. Beyond lets you make your own movies. Sorry, folks at home. I know you're getting sick as I flip back through here. 
Beyond is a tool, as I say, is more fun than a box of puppies. Uh, I also say that if you don't find if you don't find Beyond fun and amazing, then your soul is dead. It's just one of those online tools that just is really, really cool. You could make the on as something as simple as a introduction to something as complex as delivery of material. It is a very simple tool. All these tools that we're going to be using, the uh, pick the chart for infographics, the beyond, uh, Buncee, on and on and on. These are tools that you'll be using an account that's owned by me. You have free access to that account. Uh, normally it's a paid account. Uh, the same thing would go for the Ed Puzzle that we'll be using in UDL. These are yours to use. If you find that they have value to you, uh, you're, used, you're allowed to use them in your classroom. Uh, the Beyond, there is a thing, there used to be a thing in the Beyond when it was called GoAnimate that you had to be of a certain age before you could use it, which I get. Um, but now they've, they've changed all that. The thing about Beyond that's gotten so good is it's no longer uh, flash based. It's, it's HTML5 based, so it works really well. So we'll talk about that. So that's four. The fifth one, irresistibly engaging. This is where we kind of, an assessment. This is where we kind of get down to some brass tacks about how do you actually create something in a classroom setting, Google Classroom setting, or any setting, frankly, for that matter, that is actually gets at what uh, Mike, Dr. Fullen calls as irresistibly engaging. How do you create content that is that? Uh, so we'll be looking at a whole slew of things that can do that. And as you see here, here's his first acknowledgement, which later on, this was in 13, I think the book, the deep learning book came out in 15. Here's his first acknowledgement of the thinking that he had back then. Uh, as you can see here, he talks about, um, in Stratosphere, I talk about that learning solutions have to meet four criteria. They must be irresistibly engaging for both students and teachers, ele elegantly efficient and easy to access and use, technologically ubiquitous 24 seven, and steeped in real life problem solving. Then he goes on to say that they need to meet the six C's. Now the six C's went on to become the deep learning stuff that you hear about in Jefferson County. Uh, and those are critical thinking and problem solving, communication, collaboration, creative thinking and imagination, character education. Uh, the C with the character education and citizenship, they kind of go together. So it's to me, it's really interesting that JCPS is, has glommed on to this um, because the book that he wrote on it, I, I really was seriously thinking about switching books and using it for our class. But uh, when I've read it, I think Stratosphere is a good place to kind of step into this world that Fullen is talking about. But at some point, I'm going to have to come up with a course that's about the deep learning because there's some really interesting things in there. You're going to be designing an interactive lesson that you will put in that classroom space. Um, but I hope that you will realize that you can put it into any space. I could put them in here if I wanted to. Uh, when I opened up this folder inside of here, here are some really interesting things from a company called Buncee. We will teach you how to make a Buncee. Uh, and then here I've got just about every simulation that's out there, especially the ones from the FET people. Um, these can be put in as well. Uh, then we have some social studies simulations for those people. Gizmos is far primarily for my elementary people. Uh, although there's there's some stuff in here that you could use at a middle and high school level as well. And all of these things, all of these things, we will learn how we can put those into uh, that one-stop shop, as call it, that classroom space. The last thing that we do that is a module, that is a project-based learning, is coding. Um, Coding for a while, there was a hot, hot topic in the state of Kentucky, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, still is out in uh, the Commonwealth. One of the things that the Commonwealth has going that it really likes to toot its horn about, and I think appropriately so, is it has more females 
in coding classes in middle and high school than any other state in the union. That's a that's something to be proud of. Uh, when I first created this, it was a two-level coding uh, module. We did a uh, the scratch, and we did something called C++. Um, I had so many students that got so upset over the whole C++ thing. Uh, and then I tried doing it with uh, just using what's called uh, Robot C, which is a sort of watered down version of uh, programming language C. But again, people just really, they, they were like, I'm, I'll never use this, I'll never use this. So going back and looking at Scratch again, what I realized was that I had a really nice platform here that we could use to help kids understand basic logical thinking principles. Uh, what does it mean to logically think through a problem? What does it mean to think like an engineer? What does it mean to realize that your first swing at something may not be successful? Well, how do you go back and then evaluate where the, the failure point was? How do you do all that stuff? Uh, and, and do it in a way that helps kids understand that it pertains to what they do every single day. It doesn't have to be a, a programming class. When I started using this with kids in JCPS, the first group that I went and worked with were adjudicated youth at the various uh, schools that we have in JCPS. And the reason why is I like, I like tough kids. Um, I just like them. I like being around them. Um, you know, I don't mind the F bomb every once in a while. It doesn't bother me. Uh, but what I try to, what I try to get at is why do you hate school? Well, I hate it. You know, my teacher, did you hate the teacher or did you hate the subject? Well, I hated the subject too. Okay. So how do we get around that? How can we get you back in to try it again in a different way? Going back to universal design for learning. So what I would do is I would go into classrooms, uh, specifically math, and we would look at coding. Uh, and we looked at something, we started with Scratch, to show kids how to think logically and to realize that when you're using this, you're using a whole hell of a lot of mathematics. You just don't realize you're doing it. Um, and then we, we went on to use the... Uh, the coding that's a part of the Legos, the Mindstorms, the RCXs uh, that are still in schools. We still are using it. Then when we went to VEX, VEX uses what I call the Robot C, or what they call the Robot C, excuse me. Um, and it, it has become such an integral part of buying those extremely expensive packages that it kind of turned me off and I came back home to Scratch because in Scratch, uh, I can lay bare what it really is I'm trying to get you to understand here. We can see those pieces. Um, I make this as, <laughs> I mean, it, this is like holding your hands, folks. Uh, there's the code. <laughs> there's the code to make this little shark attack game. Uh, and it's a game. When I go in and teach uh, beginning coding to kids, I focus on the one thing that they all want to do. They want to build a game. Well, building a true game would take us over into um, something called U Unity Code. I have a good friend out in Bullock County, uh, and he teaches kids Unity Code. And I've thought about teaching Unity Code here, but the couple of times I've shown it to people, again, they all go running out the door screaming, this is not a CIS course, what the hell are you doing? Uh, you know, and then I get a call from my chair and they're like, what are you doing teaching CIS courses? And I thought, okay, fine. We're, we're just not going to go there. But I still can say to kids, what are games about? What's the first thing a game is before it is anything else? It's a story. It's a story. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a game that is a story first. So my language arts teachers, when they hear that, they're kind of like, oh, okay. So I can talk about the different parts of a story at the same time as we're looking at this game structure. So this game structure is very simple. It's very straightforward. What you'll be required to do is literally, you can just literally 
look at this and, and put it into your version of Scratch that you will have. And then what I'll ask you to do for the project is to go in here and change up the variables to make it yours. Okay? Uh, if you want to make it a shark game where the shark is trying to capture as many fish as you can, you go right ahead. If you want to make it the... Um, What's the name of the movie about the lost fish that tries to find her way back home? Nemo. Nemo. If you want to make it a Nemo game, then you can have the Nemo is the antagonist and have her trying to try to get away from all these different predators, etc., in the game. But that's it. The code. That's how easy I make it for you. Uh, that's the sixth one. And then our last module that we do, the course is your final. Now, the final is all about reflection. What I'm trying to get you to do in this final is I'm trying to get you to think back over what we have done and to think back over how it fits into your new understandings of how technology can be used. So as you can see, it's basically you talking back to me. I am not interested in the great American novel here. What I'm more interested in is for you to give me an understanding of your thinking. And so I'll say things in here like, I don't need to see anything more than three paragraphs, three to five sentences in each. Um, describing the TPAC process, how do you see it working within what you're trying to do or could do? Uh, number two is, how do you see your Google Classroom meeting Fullen's little thing here about irresistibly engaging, eloquently efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then, of course, the teaching digital natives. This is, you know, this one's the easiest, frankly, I think, to do. Is Does this really exist? Do you think there really are digital natives? You know what the data shows, by the way? There aren't. The data shows that anecdotally what we have done, and I'm just as guilty as anybody, I have a little one-year-old that belongs to uh, a nephew of mine. And he comes over and he stays at our house while my nephew and his wife uh, work. She's a pediatric a nurse. He works for a guy here in town who's a multimillionaire who married his mother. His mother's father, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, died of cancer. And this gal met this other guy. They get married. He's a multimillionaire. So when it came time for them to put their newborn somewhere, they chose us. Because who's better to look after kids than two former teachers? And this little one-year-old, he comes to my house. He is so, he's such a joy to be around. I don't get to be around with him. My wife does. But my point is, what do you want to grab? I want to grab my phone. Because my phone's bigger than Julie's phone. And he grabs my phone. He's sitting there messing with it. So when people see that, they go, ah, the digital native. Now, you know as well as I do, is he doing anything meaningful on that phone? Nope, not a bit, not a bit. So what is really happening here is children at a very early age, and the data shows this so clearly, what they have is a freedom and an ability to not be afraid of technology. They haven't, they haven't failed at it, or if they do fail at it, because technology is, is so forgiving of failure, they'll keep trying. That's the real digital native. Now, after you've tried technology, and usually this happens in a computer class at a school somewhere, where somebody is standing over you going, you didn't indent that paragraph the right way in your Word document. When you experience it that way, it gets wrung out of you, that desire. So then what you basically see this as, it's a consumer device. It's a way for you to communicate to people. Um, when I have seen schools, high schools specifically, try to uh, implement phone use in their classrooms for research purposes, et cetera, the problem is the kids are already, you know, they're over here in whatever, text, um, Instagram, Facebook, whatever they have available that they're using on their phones. So, I think the digital native is real in the sense that we are now all walking around 
with these things in our hands and they've taken the place of so many things and my god have you seen what's coming down the road uh wireless charging have you been reading about this so i no longer have to plug this thing in it'll be as ubiquitous as wi-fi so in other words when i walk into a wi-fi network there'll be the wi-fi network which is a communication level and then below that there'll be a charging level and if i have the right kind of phone to understand what we already have it right near field nfc you already have that where you walk up to the thing in the, in the store and you hold your phone next to it and he goes oh i know what you are click boom paid I already have it so what we have to do now is we have to increase the bandwidth for it to then be able to talk to the phone um you know 5g although 5g is a mess of a standard right now but 5G would literally get us to the point where we literally could sit and watch an entire movie on our phone. I don't know about you. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to that at all. But, you know, and then the whole robotics thing that is taking off like a shot. Um, you know, very early on, I got fascinated by robotics. I have a robot that is in my office right now that I made when I was a kid. And, and I'm 65 years old. So it's like, you know, we've always had this idea of what a robot is, um, and we have them now. If you have a Google or a Echo device in your home, you talk into the computer from Star Trek, remember? Computer, remember? And when I first got my first Alexa device, let's see if my phone does something. No, it didn't. When I got my first Alexa device in my home, my wife was like, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to turn the whole house into a smart home. And I made the wake name on my Alexa device computer because I wanted to have that feeling of talking to the computer on the bridge in Star Trek. Drove her nuts, drove her nuts. Then more devices started showing up because they were put into various parts of the house. And now she was like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm turning the place into a smart home. And you know what was interesting? And I know I'm off track and I apologize, but you've got to understand you all are right in the middle. We are all right in the middle of this because there's a really, there's an enormous change headed our way. So we had the, the light bulbs. Remember the Philips Hue light bulbs? And you could go in and you could say, I'd like to have the color for, because I'm going to have a date with my wife tonight and I'd like to be romantic. Okay. That's all been replaced now by, and they were expensive. They were like $50 for one stupid bulb. Well, of course, the bulb prices have come way down, but what's really come way down are the switches. You plug it into the normal plug, you plug the device into the switch, that thing now talks to your device. And so I can walk in my house now and I go into the living room and I can say, Alexa, turn on the TV. Now I can have a smart TV as well, but if I still wanna have my direct TV or something like that, I can still do it by having my plug. We are in really, really interesting times when it comes to technology. I think um, what we'll see is once we sort out the 5G, once we sort out the charging capability, things are really going to start taking off because then we don't have to worry about our phones ever dying. And if we can figure out how to do it on a phone, on a computer, on a laptop, on a uh, tablet, what keeps us from not doing it on roads so that those electric cars can stay charged as they travel down the highways? It won't happen in my lifetime because I got about what 30 years left, but easily within your lifetime, this stuff will happen. Oh, and I saw the day where Uber's ready to do their air taxis. I'll have to ride one of those. Uh, four teaching resources. Basically, what I'm asking you to do is to think about the stuff that you played with in this uh, class. How do you see it working? I want you to be honest and I want you to see, say, I don't see how it fits. I'm not ready for this but you need to explain to me why you're not ready for this. And then the last one, of course, is a direct callback to this Google Classroom, virtual classroom thing that we'll build. What of, of it are you the most comfortable with? What are you the least comfortable with and why? There's your final. Gentlemen, I will have us and ladies and gentlemen out there in the great beyond, we should be finished before the official end of class. And I'm doing that because because I've taken some things out of here that normally we would have. But I've done that and I'm now telling you all what I've already told Mark and Steve is they also assigned me to teach a class that is on this very night at this very time. Um, and when I tried to get that changed, nobody wanted to change it. So 
I'm now telling you that on the following date, I'll send this out in an email here right after class. The following date for this semester, we will not meet because I'll be sitting in here with 32 people. Can you imagine this room with 32 people in it, guys? You get to be real good friends. Uh, we will not meet on for the month of January. We will not be in here on January the 24th. We will not meet in here on February 21. We will not meet in here on March 21. And we will not meet in here on Looks like I don't have one in uh, I should have one here. Yeah. We will not meet in here on April the 11th. Well, we're so close to the end of class, you'll be done by then. Anyway, you'll be done. And why do I do that? Well, number one, because of this screw up about me having to carry two courses on the same night. But really, it goes back to that first statement I made about when are things due. I give you the time at the end of the course so that you can have the time to really do a good job on this stuff. Uh, there are rubrics and everything, but you'll notice the rubrics are really geared toward not necessarily technical aspects, as more as they are geared toward do I hear your voice? Do I do I get a sense of what you're trying to do with this? Are you telling me how you see how this would work in a classroom? Um, I'm not looking for cookie cutter. I'm definitely I'm not looking for cookie cutter. I will show you cookie cutter, okay? Because we all need examples. But what I want from you is stuff that shows me that you are doing it, you are, you are looking at it through the eyes of your understandings, not mine. I don't care about mine. So let me go back and give you some examples. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do before we meet again next week, and you will be shown how to do this, is right here where it says technology in schools. This thing is called a Padlet. You can embed Padlets into the Google Classroom. Uh, a Padlet is a way for you to crowdsource. Uh, and for you, Mark, Padlets can be done on multiple devices. It doesn't have to be a computer. So I could have a Padlet that I would send people to over in the planetarium if they have devices, either, you know, tablets, phones, or whatever, and I can crowdsource. Now, this looks pretty slick right here because what we're going to ask you all to do is to actually put a picture in your Padlet, in your uh let me show you what it looks like, really. So as you can see, it looks like a cork board. You can make it have all kinds of backgrounds. I can click on the plus sign here, and there you go. It gives me a Padlet. And as you can see, when I do that, I, it's waiting for me to put a title in here. So the title that we did for the folks in the last semester's class was obviously their name. So I could put in Steve Swan. Now it's waiting right here for me to write something or look what I got down here, guys. I can upload something. So if there's a file that I want to share with you, I can upload that. Uh, here's how these folks did this one. They went out and found pictures, just did a Google search, right? Got the, the Google link, put it in here, and then it shows up as a picture. Uh, as you can see here, there's the Google, even easier. And then here is a snap, okay? Uh, what I'll do after class tonight is I'll go through and look, kids, look, look, look what you can throw in here. Okay? Pretty damn cool what you can do with it. So this is a tool that we will use in our classes because what I'm going to be asking you to do in a lot of these modules that are in here is like down here when you go and create your pick the chart, this is where you're going to put it. Okay, so let's take a look at Maddie's that she had created last semester. And when you click on it, it takes you to the chart 
or takes you back to the infographic right here where she went through and again this is not cookie cutter steve didn't say this is how you have to do it i don't like that i want people to think i want them to show me their thinking about what they're doing and when we did that as you can see there's all kinds of different ways that people have demonstrated their understanding of chapters look at uh, katarina she does a good work she does nice work so in hers as you can see, she uses lots and lots of graphics. That's what an infographic is. It's supposed to be a way for kids to understand their instruction by using graphics to put it together. Okay. And that's the power of the infographic. These are used a lot, by the way, out in schools. Now, there are plenty of people. Katie is a good example. Katie is very much, she's very much literate in the way she views the world. She sees the world as words and text, and that's fine. As you can see, she's gone in and hers is very text laden. Not a problem with that. Although down here at the bottom, she went kind of crazy and put in lots of cool pictures that she has from her teaching. So we're gonna be using these for taking apart two and three and four and five. They're called Padlets. Uh, I will show you how they work when we get ready to do that. But for right now, all I'm asking you to do is on this first one. By the way, you don't have to do it tonight. We'll do it next Thursday. Okay, we'll do it all together. What we'll do next Thursday is I'll show you how it works, and I'll show you how to make it. Although, after what I just showed you, by the way, how long did it take me to explain that? Not long. Okay, that's the whole point of it. Is it should be something fast. should be something down and dirty. There's another one out there called... Um, Answer Garden. Uh, you'll see Answer Garden when we get further in. Answer Garden is something that you can also put up that you can use as a way of, in JCPS parlance, in public school parlance, we can we call this the parking lot. This is where if you're doing a PD with, with folks or if you're teaching, um, you can have that place for people to put up their questions or their understandings or their misunderstandings. And as you can see, I keep mine normally at anonymous because I want people to feel free to ask or say anything they want. Now for these purposes, I did ask everybody to put in a title that was their name. But normally when I do this and I'm doing it with kids, I leave it as anonymous and the title can be the, I don't get it. <laughs> Okay, or invariably you're going to get the kid that puts what the F in. I mean, invariably you're going to get that. Actually, you get WTF. I mean, you know, kids really aren't that bad. But you invariably get something like that. But the point is that then the information they put in after that helps me understand what it is that they need to know and then to understand. Um, I will, as I said, I've been recording this. It will be all put out there. Uh, after I'll have it up tomorrow morning because it takes a while for it to crunch it. I'm going to jump back in here. Did anybody ever show up? Mark, you've been sitting in the room all this time. I haven't back yet. Let's see. It says I'm disconnected right now. Yeah, well, see. there's just me right now. And that's fine. Not a problem. As I said, this is not a problem. So let me turn to you two gentlemen who are sitting here with me. What questions do you have? What concerns do you have? What do you need to know before we walk out of here tonight? Was I not in, or how do I get in? Was I supposed to be in there with you? Are you not in the Blackboard? I mean, I'm in the Blackboard, yeah. You don't have to worry about the Collaborate. Okay, yeah, right, that's for the people. The only thing, in, Collaborate is just for people in the great beyond. If there is a reason, like you're sick one night and you can't get in here, the car breaks down. Are you married? No, sir. Okay. So, you know, if you got a family issue and you can't be here, you're going to let me know. And as I just said, you can either come in synchronously, meaning like right now, you'd be here or that night. Or you can come in asynchronously, meaning oh, I'll just go watch the video that Steve posts. Okay. Don't take advantage of it. But it's there for you to use. I mean, you know, if I was that, that instructor who basically took class and took uh, enrollment and took, you know, are you here? Are you taking attendance? Are you late? I'm not that instructor. All I care about is you learning something and playing with it. One of the key takeaways of, and then we'll stop. 
One of the key takeaways from TPAC is the following. Teachers need to have hands-on experiences with affordances that they can play with that are related to their curriculum before true technology integration can occur. Now that playful interaction with affordances means an affordance is something you use to do something else. The brake on your car is an affordance you use to stop the car. If we don't give you the time, the freedom, the fail-safe environment to play with technology, then you'll never use it. Data shows that time, time, time again. When we did data on the PD things that we did in Jefferson County Public Schools, it had to do with technology. And people would come away and they would say, well, they came to the, the session, because you had to have so many credit hours, you know this, you had to have so many PD hours where you can get off. Um, they would come to the technology ones because they thought they would be the easy ones. That was before I took over. Um, and when we would do them, we would be like two hours in of a three hour PD and I would say, now your job is to create something and post it somewhere so that others can take advantage of your new knowledge that you've had in class. That's what we should do. You, as the teacher in a classroom, have to realize that you can't do anything with kids using technology until you're comfortable with it, until you understand that you need a, you need a plan B, C, and D in your back pocket in case something goes wrong. But more importantly, you need to understand how to get the kids to understand the skinny. This is what we're doing with this. This is how you work with it and then get the hell out of the way and let them create something that demonstrates their understanding of whatever the content is that you are creating. And yes, that can look like here is a Google class assignment. Here is a Word doc. Excuse me. Excuse me. Here's a Google Doc that I want you to work on in collaboration with somebody else. Good stuff there, good stuff there. I went and visited a school uh, here at the beginning of the, the year, uh, a middle school where every kid had a uh, Android tablet. And uh, I sat down in this lady's uh, Project Lead the Way class, good, good class, good lady. And I was just sitting there and at some point I realized they had put all their technology away. It was on the floor. And I said, could we get the technology out, please? Boy, it flew up on those tables. And they were flipping open, and we did a little exercise together. At some point, I realized that people were off the reservation. They were doing other things. And the teacher was getting a little concerned about it. And I said, let's find out what the other things are, and let's then see the relevancy of what they're doing. So we you know, called upon some kids. And this one guy, I was there to talk about Robot C and other things. And this one guy had already gone to the website that I talked about. And he was working on things. And he said, well, he said, I'm trying to program this thing because the Robot C website has these little things that you can work through, these little assignments. He said, I'm already up to assignment number five. How do you do X? And I told him, I said, this is what you need to do with your code. And then he was like, okay. He was gone. Well, I'm sorry. That's how we all learn. You know, if, if we're given the opportunity to, if someone gives us information that helps us see it, how it works, Fullens the skinny, then what we are more accustomed to doing is playing around and seeing where it goes. What we have to get kids to realize is that's how we, that's how we learn. But we also have to get kids to realize is you can't just go in to something cold. Somebody has to explain the language of what it is we're learning to you. That's our job. Our job is explain language. And sometimes that requires us to be very lectoral, to be very, you need to focus on what I have to say for a little while, and then I turn you loose. I've had you guys here for five, for about an hour. I'm done. And it's not because I could keep going. I could keep going but I want you to be able to have a chance to digest what I have been sitting here saying to you tonight. So if you have no more questions, thank you. Make sure you grab something on the way out the door if you needed something to eat to kind of get your blood sugar back up. Um, I will always have something here for you to eat when you walk in this door. It's just the three of us. 
And we're going to have to be careful because we could very easily uh, divulge or devolve into the uh, gentlemen's club here because <laughs> if everybody else is not going to show up, <laughs> we're going to have to be very specific about and very intentional about some of the stuff we do. Uh, so I'm going to have to depend upon you guys to kind of slow me down if I go too fast, because if I'm going fast for you, then you know those folks who are in the great beyond. I'm going fast for them. Everybody in the great beyond, this video will be posted uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, it will be inside the um, module, just like if you look here. Let's see if we have it. Yeah, here are the old ones from last semester, as you can see. When I click on there you go. You can see what it's going to look like. Um, and that's where I have gone in. And I turn the I turn the recording on as soon as I get in here because um, sometimes I forget to turn on the volume or turn on the microphone. But so you kind of see that, but then when it gets going, that you actually see the course, you actually see what's going on. So that'll be up there uh, come tomorrow morning, and I'll get rid of the old ones because you don't need to be looking at those. Oh, and one of the things that people always say to me, they go, it's so tiny. Well, if you notice, it's a YouTube video. So all I got to do is click on the thing to make it bigger, and, you know, it'll blow up in a full YouTube format, or if you want to go all the way into YouTube and watch it and then click on it and make it bigger, you know, you can uh, that is something that I'm assuming that you have an understanding of how YouTube works so that you can make the changes that you need to be able to see all this. Okay, that's it. I am now done. I'm going to be turning off the recording now, gentlemen. It just was turned off. Okay, you got anything else? I have one question. Yep. On module three, mm -hmm. when we click on it, it says become a Google certified teacher. Uh, so that would be something I no. could look at right there. You could do that. Yeah. Uh, it took, when I did my first Google certification, uh, I had a PhD student who now came down at Transy. And she is a math teacher par excellence, and she wanted to become Google certified. Hadn't even heard of the damn thing. So she walks into my office one day and she says, we need to get Google certified. Oh, why? She said, because they're doing all this with Google Classroom. What the hell? So we sat down and we just started going through it. I will tell you on that evening, you don't have to be a Google certified teacher to work in this class, okay? But I would say to you, we are becoming such an entrepreneurial profession these days that if you can get Google certified, it's one more notch you can put on that resume. So when you walk into a school, if you wanna move from your school and go to another school, you could say to that principal, by the way, I'm a Google certified teacher. How long does it take? Get yourself a group of people. Seriously, back at school, you know, in the PLC, you know, go ahead and lead the charge. Let's all get Google certified. Let's just literally sit here after school. It'll take us three afternoons, three afternoons, and we get Google certified. It's that simple to do. I'm really serious. Now, if you want to become a Google certified trainer, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that was their, one of their questions they asked me in my interview last year yep. uh, at the Brown School. Yep. And I was like, uh, nope. What? <laughs> yep. So. See, that's why I'm saying it. You, If you can go in and have that notch, you know, have that on your belt, and you can say, hey, I, I am, they'll go, okay. You know, and there's one more little tick mark next to your name in terms of things to do. Now, what we have to realize is, especially in JCPS, hell next year, Heather, who is the Google queen, she could be gone. In the time I've sat and talked to her, she's like, well, you know, I really want to be a superintendent. Okay, so you're not going to be around for very long. You're going to notch a belt and you're going to move on. I get it. I get it. You're young. I get it. So it may not be around. But they've bought into it. You know why they bought into it? Why are they tell, why are they giving you a Chromebook as a new teacher? Why are they giving you the option of having a Chromebook? You know why? Money. It costs the district hundreds of thousands of dollars as it costs you a bill. Hundreds of thousands of dollars to remain a Microsoft Enterprise license. Okay? How much does it cost to have a Google domain? Fifty. Fifty dollars. So Jefferson County Public Schools, how many kids do we have? 100? 100. 
thousand yes. some on. How many teachers we have? Five thousand some on. And a thing to make it all work together costs me how much? Fifty. How much does it cost for me to give a teacher a computer device? Two to three hundred. Whereas in the old days when we were handing out those HPs, you know, those are full blown, you know, Windows based computers that were fifteen hundred dollars a pop. Don't even get me started on the Mac. Um, although I'm a Mac guy, but I, you know, I, if I were buying computers today, would I be buying Macs? No. Would I be buying iPads? Yes. I think the iPad, the iOS environment on an iPad is still superior to the Android environment. I, you know, but if I were doing computers for teachers or laptops for computers, you damn well better believe it'd be a Chromebook. Especially now that we've gotten, uh, Jeff Hardy is the guy who did it over in the IT, uh, over on uh, with those wonderful guy. He's the one who made our Wi-Fi in our buildings as strong as it is today. Give him all the credit in the world. He's a great guy. So in that kind of environment, with the kind of broadband that we can do with Chromebooks, because Chromebooks do not snarf up the broadband like these things do, Max, Windows, whatever. So again, yeah. I'd be Chromebooking it all over the place. In fact, I have one. I have a very nice Chromebook. You all have Manolo's, I think, that version they bought for you, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I don't hate it. You know, I ain't seen them, but I know they're coming. Yeah. I think they bought the one that has the hinge that does, you know, all the way back and over. So you can TP it, you know. Now, U of L. <laughs> don't even get me started on U of L's IT department, man. You all deal with them, too. Yeah. I mean, uh, Drew and I sit. Much, Drew and I sit and just kind of shake our heads sometimes at the stuff that they try to. Uh, of course, I you know they think Novell is still the best operating system that's out there, and I just kind of go, okay, guys, if you're that far behind the curve, and of course, as you know, and anybody who works for a university, all the things that have happened to us, we just have so much that just got killed. <laughs> You know, I mean, the, the lady who was head of IT had to leave. Uh, told everybody she had cancer, but she really had to leave. And then they made the IT person a vice president, and he's tried to change things. But you look at places like the Big Ten. Who's the Big Ten? Well, that's Penn State. That's IU. That's, I mean, you know, Minnesota. Those are some fairly well-known names out there. You know what they use for all of their stuff? Google. Why do they do it? It's free. Or it's $50 yeah, yeah. to get a domain. In fact, it's so funny. I tried to get Google training here so that our faculty here could understand what teachers are doing out there in their classrooms. Oh, my God. You thought I had invited the ISIS folks into this college. I don't mean my college. It wasn't my dean. My dean was fine. I mean the IT people. They were like, you're going to do what? 